Thank you. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land and pay our respects to the elders, both past and present and future, of the Turrbal tribe. I'm Peter Switzer, I'm your MC for today, and I'd like to welcome you to the 2014 Queensland Small Business Week. And thanks for uh, joining us in this beautiful um, Ithaca Auditorium in the City Hall. Of course, I'd like to uh, welcome the Premier, uh, Campbell Newman, Thanks for coming along today and distinguished guests. But of course, I know the Premier is here for small business. This is what this work's about. And Queensland, I think, is the grand central of small business. I know that. I get the feedback from small business people when they agree with me and they even contact me when they don't agree with me. But certainly, this is a place where, when Queensland small business is rocking, I have a very positive attitude towards the Australian economy. And I think that's actually happening right now. And so I'm really glad to be a part of this week. Um, I should say to you, many people might know you, well, know me, because of my, my journalism in either The Weekend Australian or on my television show, um, the Switzer program on the Sky Business Channel at 7 o'clock each night, repeated at 9.30, just in case you've missed it. <laughs> now, by the way, you can tell that I'm not just a journalist. I'm actually a small business owner. Any chance to promote your business, you will do it. Um, but, but in actual fact, I don't ever consider myself a journalist. I'm a, I'm a, a method actor slash journalist. Um, you know, we have uh, the switzer.com.au website, the Grow Your Business website. We have a, a young woman's magazine called Rush, um, Rush, which is a very popular magazine. We have the Switzer Super Report, and we have a, a financial planning business. Um, and uh, so w we are right into small business. We've got 45 uh, staff members nowadays. So I really feel as though I, I know the beat. My wife and I started the business many years ago. Uh, and I know that a lot of small businesses, particularly in the state, are couples. And I know the success in business is invariably related to those couples and a commitment to the goal that they start off with and the dream and the people they take along on, on the journey. And my favourite story around commitment, I think is a real small business story of a couple, and they were in business for themselves. And the husband was really feeling sick and he wouldn't go to the doctor, so eventually his wife made him go and she went with him to make sure he went and she waited outside while he had the examination. When it, it was all over, he walked out, didn't say anything to his wife, went straight to the car. But she wasn't going to have that, so she went straight to the doctor and said, Doctor, can you tell me what my husband's prognosis is? I'm really worried about him. And the doctor said, you should be. I think your husband's a candidate for a heart attack or stroke unless things change in his life. And she said, well, I'm committed to helping him. What can I do? And he said, great. We'll get up early each morning, chop up fresh fruit, get yogurt in. We'll change his breakfast. When he comes home from work, let's have uh, steamed fish and vegetables. We'll change his lifestyle totally. But also, while he's under stress and I'm worried about him, could you try not to nag him because, you know, I, I am worried about him. He said, and also, if you could could you try and have intimate moments with him six or seven times a week? <laughs> if you do that, I think your husband could make it. And she said, thanks very much, doctor. So they're driving home. The husband looked at her and said, honey, I saw you talking to the doctor. You know, what is my uh, prognosis? And she looked at him lovingly and said, honey, I don't think you're going to make it. <laughs> we always have to go the extra mile in small business. And that's why I love it when uh, a government tries to get experts, people with insights to help build the competitive advantage and I know uh, one of the speakers today is certainly going to do that. So um, my, my role here of course is to keep the show going but I also want to make the, the important point. Queensland's business, quick facts, small businesses employ about 1 million people. Brisbane has approximately 115,826 businesses and startups. There are over 403,000 small businesses in Queensland and small business accounts for about 95% of all Queensland businesses. Over 220 events are being hosted during the week, including webinars, lunches, breakfast workshops and plenty of networking. Today we're talking about when small businesses think big. And our keynote speaker certainly has a big profile. Professor Josh Lerner joins us from the Harvard Business School in the United States, and uh, we welcome him. I'd love you to put your hands together for Josh, who's here. <laughs> we should also thank the sponsors that make these sorts of events possible. And the gold sponsor is PwC, and our silver sponsor is QUT Business School. They deserve a round of applause as well. 
And I now would like to call to the stage the Honourable Jan Stuckey, the Minister for Tourism, Major Events, Small Business and the Commonwealth Games. Thank you so much, Peter. I, I actually told Peter last week I had to turn him down from going on his show because I didn't have a voice, but I do have it back pretty well um, this week because I knew I'd be needing it for all of the wonderful events. Could I um, acknowledge the Honourable Campbell Newman MP, the Premier of Queensland, Mr Mark Brennan, the Australian Small Business Commissioner, Professor Josh Lerner, who's the Professor for Investment Banking at Harvard Business School and Head of Entrepreneurship Management Unit as well. To Dr Richard Eden, the Director General of my department. To my Queensland Small Business Advisory Council members. To PricewaterhouseCoopers, and again, we thank you so much for being a gold sponsor today. To all of the Mentoring for Growth mentor members who are here today, thank you so much. And of course, Peter, um, thank you for sharing with us your daytime um, as well, of course, those nighttime commentaries. Could I welcome everyone to City Hall? On behalf of the State Government, I'm really delighted to be able to host today's When Small Business Think Big Business Leaders Lunch. Now, if you say that very quickly, you get into a lot of trouble. It does, though, officially welcome 2014 Queensland Small Business Week. Last year, the inaugural 2013 Queensland Small Business Week featured 91 events and attracted more than 4,500 participants. This year, as you've heard from Peter, we have actually over 240 events. They seem to be growing by the day, as well as many other activities being held right across the state. Now, that's almost triple what we had last year. The week provides a multitude of opportunities for small business owners and operators to network, connect to new ideas and information, be motivated and celebrate the important contribution that you make to Queensland's economy. It is vital that you all talk amongst yourselves, discuss ideas and draw inspiration so that you can prosper and grow. And Queensland Small Business Week provides the vehicle to do just that. The Premier and the rest of the LNP team are unashamedly pro-small business because we understand that small business underpins our Queensland economy. In fact, it's the backbone of it. Like many of my government colleagues, I come from a small business background and I'm therefore thrilled to be hosting a number of events, not only in Brisbane, but also the Sunshine and Gold Coast and out in Roma later this week. And could I add, that I'm really pleased to see that not only a lot of small businesses are here today, but those from medium and large businesses as well. Everyone starts small though, don't they? Small businesses complement the economic activity of larger organisations and are integral to your supply chains. And that is why it's so important for all businesses to be thinking big, but especially for small businesses looking at taking that next step. As I've said, there's heaps more activities in store. If you like what you're seeing today, I suggest that you engage in a little bit more throughout the week. Go online to our business portal, www.business.qld.gov.au, Small Business Week, and find out more. But it really does give me enormous pleasure to now introduce to the stage Queensland Premier, the Honourable Campbell Newman, to speak to you further about small business here in our great state. Well, thanks very much, Jan, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, with so many people who make such an important contribution to the economic lifeblood of Queensland. Uh, can I acknowledge the Turbul and Jagera peoples? I acknowledge Jan Stuckey, uh, my cabinet colleague, to Mark Brennan, to Professor, Professor Josh Lerner. It's a great pleasure to see you here today, sir, and we're really looking forward to what you have to say. I met uh, Josh in New York uh, back in March this year. To Trevor Mahoney from uh, 
uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, our gold sponsor, and to Professor Xavier from the Queensland University of Technology, our silver sponsor. But to you, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming. Well, I've got a speech here. It's the second speech today where I've said exactly what I'm about to say now, and that is I don't like the speech that they've given me today. So I'm going to speak sort of from here and maybe a bit from here, and I'll see if I can well make, bring it all together and make sense. The first thing I wanted to say to you is, like many of my Cabinet colleagues, I've actually run a small business. I've also been in a big business. I've also been in the public service. I've also been in the military. So I can say to you, having run a small business for two years, I really absolutely get it and what's involved. And I've employed people. And I know the challenges, the responsibilities, but also the great sense of personal satisfaction when you do your own thing. What I want to do very quickly, though, is talk about where the state's going. And I am going to be quick, because I'm not the main attraction today. It is Josh. So I, I really have to race through this. The first thing I wanted to say is that we have a vision for this state now that I think is incredibly exciting. It's not the government's vision. It's the vision of 80,000 Queenslanders who had their say over the last 18 months to create the Queensland Plan. Unlike any other state, unlike the Commonwealth Government, this state has a 30-year plan with goals and targets that very clearly sets out where we've got to go and defines the Queensland that we want in the years to come. That's very powerful. Now, there are a whole range of things in there. It talks about education. It talks about health. It talks about building up the regions. In fact, it says that uh, Queenslanders want to see the population outside South East Queensland doubled over the next 30 years. That's a bold and ambitious target. If you haven't seen the plan, I really encourage you to get hold of it. You can download it from the internet. It should be an invaluable business planning tool for you because it talks about the real agenda. And all of government including local government, will be required to have regard to the Queensland plan in all the things that we then do. One of the aspects, of course, of the Queensland plan is the need for a strong and vibrant economy, for jobs to be created. Now, that's always been my government's agenda anyway. And we've been working over the last two and a half years relentlessly to supercharge the Queensland economy. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have been doing everything we can to make this the best place in Australia to do business. Because we understand business, we know that ultimately business takes care of itself if government gets out of the way. So we've had a target to reduce red tape by 20%. We've been relentlessly going through and looking at reform to get rid of needless red tape and bureaucracy. We got rid of a waste tax. We changed the documentation for real estate agents selling homes. No longer do small uh, smash repairers and vehicle uh, servicing garages have to have an environmental licence, pay $1,500 and fill out forms each year. We've changed workers' compensation laws. We have the best scheme in Australia now for employees, ladies and gentlemen. It's the only state where you're covered for journeys to and from work as an employee. However, on average, workers' compensation premiums have come down by 17% for business in this new financial year. There'll be a lot more to come. I say today, it's a thought for you for the future, through your representative organisations, you need to let us know what more we, that we can do. So Stephen Tate from CCIQ is here today, for example. He sits in my business advisory forum that meets quarterly, and that is an opportunity always for business to say, get rid of this, change that. There are roadblocks there. How come you have that charge or tax? Wouldn't it be more efficient to do it that way? I assure you we really want to know this stuff, and we will continue to undertake reform that's sensible and makes sense. The exciting thing, though, is where we're going now. If we go back three years ago, this state was in second last place in terms of the ComSec uh, ratings of states' economic performance. We were second only to Tasmania in terms of going for the wooden spoon. Now we're in second place, so we've moved up the ladder. And the exciting thing is, this financial year, we will go into lead place. We will be the lead state economically. This 
state is going to see more jobs created. We're already doing that um, than any other Australian state each month as we go forward. This state is going to see continued growth in construction, in tourism, in agriculture and, yes, in resources. And the small businesses that support all those sectors will continue to prosper. And, of course, international student education, biotechnology and IT, the games industry still will continue, I think, to grow successfully. Before I conclude, I just wanted to talk about one other thing that is very important to us that you may not have heard of. We believe, ladies and gentlemen, in a very important principle, and the principle is what we call open data. What I'm talking about is this. Government collects all sorts of information, but it's never released it in the past. Today, you can go to the Open Data website and there's some, some 1,400 data sets that we now have put out there. Information, data that has never been available before that you can use for your business. All sorts of stuff. Some of it's seemingly useless and superfluous. But, for example, today you can see the location of any bus stop in the state. You can see where the schools are. You can uh, find out what uh, motor vehicles are registered by various make and model in the suburbs and the cities and towns of Queensland. You can see real time, updated every 30 minutes, where every bushfire in Queensland is or every authorised control burn. Now, you might say, why is he going on about this? Well, ladies and gentlemen, data, information is gold. That's why we're also, this week, launching our open data competition so that uh, application developers, uh, data miners, business people can propose great ideas about how to use this data for economic advantage. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an exciting time to live in this state. This year we will become the lead economic state and I urge all small businesses to see that, realise that, seize the opportunities and take the potential of this state forward. You do employ 38% of the workforce across 403,000 businesses. If every small business employed one or two more people, just think what we'd see in terms of our jobs figures. Thank you very much for coming today. Again, I'm looking forward with keen anticipation to Professor, Professor Lerner's speech. Uh, it's great to have you here, Josh. And with those few words, I just say, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to officially declare Small Business Week 2014 open. Thank you. Thank you, Premier. I now would like to welcome today's special guest, the Australian Small Business Commissioner, Mark Brennan. Uh, thank you, Peter, and uh, thank you to everyone for the opportunity of uh, being here today with you and to welcome you to this uh, terrific event. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the Honourable Campbell Newman, the Premier of the State of Queensland, uh, the Minister for Tourism, Major Events, Small Business and the Commonwealth Games, Jan Stuckey. Uh, Professor Lerner, it's great to see that you've come over to join us today. Uh, and all small business people of Queensland, welcome. Uh, I think it's quite uh, fitting that uh, today that I've actually following the Premier because he finished off talking about uh, the importance of data and he said data is gold. Well, my office, the office of the Australian Small Business Commissioner, has a catch cry which says, no small business should fail through lack of access to information. So information, data, they're the keystones. They're the things that governments, for example, have a core responsibility for, to ensure that uh, information is available, accessible for businesses to be able to utilise in order to uh, prosper in the business environment that's created. So that's a key uh, message that our office puts out, is be hungry for information. We also, in our role, look at uh, helping businesses sort out problems they've got with other businesses, or problems they've got with government agencies. And we do this very much by encouraging people to seek to have uh, matters mediated rather than going through traditional and expensive and stressful uh, court processes. Uh, the other functions which we have is to be an advocate to government, uh, to 
uh, inform government about what we've sort of seen at the coalface uh, of the problems that are facing uh, small businesses and also to be an advocate to the business community itself. And in that regard, uh, we've got what I call our overarching aspirations. And that is that every participant in the business community can lift their game. There's scope for every participant in the business community to get better at what they do. And in terms of participants here, I'm talking about uh, big business, government agencies, media, academics, regulators, industry and professional associations and small businesses themselves. And I'll just share a couple of thoughts about each of those. Big business, there's tremendous scope for big business to show leadership to the small business community and it's very refreshing to see Price Waterhouse Cooper having such a, a role with uh, Small Business Week. Government agencies, again I found refreshing something which the Premier said about his own experiences in, in small business because too often you find that those in government who are influencing the business environment have never actually played the game of business. And coming from Victoria, an Australian rules state, one of the greatest insults you can say to somebody is you're like an umpire who's never played the game. And I think we find that at a number of levels of government that you are getting people who are influencing the business environment and yet they don't know how hard it is to get a kick in the game of small business. And so it's very refreshing to hear that of people who, have, who are in this position of being able to look at what sort of interventions there should be from government and they've actually played the game themselves. So we look to encourage government agencies to get better at what they do by understanding more about what the game of small business is all about. Uh, the media, and uh, it's good to see uh, Peter here today too, that uh, I think he may well agree with me that there are lots of opportunities for the media uh, to be more balanced and positive in the way in which they uh, uh, report on or investigate the business community. And we'd like to see uh, the media uh, look at opportunities to lift its game as well. Uh, academics and uh, Professor Werner and, uh, and also are very happy to see that Queensland University of Technology is a sponsor here because with academics, uh, I think there's scope for academics to be more practical in their research uh, or, or come up with practical solutions with their research activities. And I did notice that one of the objectives of the Queensland University of Technology is to attempt to try to make that connect between research and, and practice and I encourage academics to uh, be uh, more centred that way of uh, undertaking the research, but also looking to see, well, is a government going to adopt this as a policy? Is a practitioner going to actually put any of my research into practice uh, to assist the way in which they run their business? Industry and, and professional associations, and again, uh, Stephen Tate, nice to see you here today. Uh, again, here, there's great scope for these associations to... Um, get better at what they do, uh, to not just be a lobbyist to government but also to be a real service to their members. I did start with saying about uh, access to information being so important. Well, industry and professional associations are a tremendous uh, medium for that. Uh, regulators, and this is one of my soapboxes, um, uh, regulators, I, I really do think that regulators can contribute much more constructively to the business environment than, than what they do. It's easy and it's lazy to be a regulator who's a crackdown, clampdown regulator. I think the business community responds far more positively to a facilitative approach to regulation and I encourage regulators to look at ways of educating to comply rather than running up figures of infringements and, and cracking down on people. And then finally, small businesses themselves. Uh, all small businesses have got uh, scope to be, get better at what they do. Uh, we encourage small business to be hungry for information. Uh, getting back to where I started about uh, seeking access to information, we'll be hungry for information. Want to know more about how you can improve your business. And that's the encouragement which we give to the small business community itself. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Welcome to everybody. It's a great initiative. I really do commend the Queensland Government for putting on uh, Queensland Small Business Week. I'm sure it's going to be a terrific success. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, uh, and a very important role you play as well. Um, we're going to uh, serve our main course now, but before we go, I think the important lesson is that, and it came out in Mark's speech in particular, and also the Premier's, is that 
we in small business have to be on the lookout for things that will make a difference in our business. And invariably, it's us looking at ourselves and being objective about what we can do to lift our game. Um, in, in many cases, people find it very difficult to be objective. Me personally, I was really lucky. Um, I married someone who actually decided to become my life coach um, voluntarily. Um, and uh, Maureen decided that she would look at me on a daily basis and tell me what's wrong with me. <laughs> but more importantly, she told me what I could do to fix it. <laughs> Hence the reason why our business has done so well. And it's why I always say behind every successful man is a very surprised woman. Queensland's a state renowned for its diverse and innovative business community. Research has shown that business sentiment is high and Queensland is positioned well to build to our competitive strengths. But what is happening beyond our local economy? Is Queensland's entrepreneurial drive and determination translating to results on a global scale? Today's keynote speaker is the Jacob H. Schiff Professor of Investment Banking at Harvard Business School, as well as the head of the entrepreneurial unit in the United States. Professor Josh Lerner is a member of the World Economic Forum, at which he presents annually on small business issues and entrepreneurship. The Queensland Government invited Professor Lerner today to shed light on Queensland's performance on the world stage. He's drawn on his vast experience, experience running Harvard's flagship executive education program for smaller, fast-growing businesses to provide insight into how businesses can flourish when it thinks big. I would like now to welcome Professor Lerner to the stage. Thank you so much for that nice introduction as well as for the chance to be here and a chance to address such an august audience. Um, there's certainly no shortage of issues that one could talk about, and this is certainly a topic that we could um, spend many, many hours discussing. In fact, as a professor of entrepreneurship, I'd like to spend many hours talking about this, but I realize that people have to go off into their, um, uh, their real jobs and go out making um, great businesses and the like. So I'll just simply touch on a few things. I think most importantly, Today is about celebrating small businesses and the contributions that they've made. And we'll talk a little bit today about why, why we think this is just simply such an enormously important activity and why, why small businesses are so much at the heart of what policymakers, not just in Queensland, but really throughout the world are today thinking about. So I'll spend a bunch of time on that, and then we'll turn to perhaps the more challenging topic of um, how to, s clearly today is an enormously challenging time for small businesses as well. And we'll talk about some of the ways to address these challenges and the role both government as well as small businesses themselves have in this process. I'll steal a little bit from my books, um, particularly the Boulevard of Broken Dreams, but we'll really get a chance to dig into um, a number of these things. I think play, perhaps the place to start, though, is why small business? Why is this such an incredibly important topic today? And I think the big reason comes back to the numbers. I just simply put here a few numbers from, uh, you know, from US in terms of the amount of debt going sky high over time and Great Britain here. But you know, certainly many places sort of say, governments are sort of grappling with saying, how do we get economic economic vitality and activity, activity going. Even places which might be seen really happy, like China, where things are growing, growing well, there's also worries of saying, how do we get jobs for everyone? And in a lot of cases, the answer comes down to saying, we need growth. Now, the question is, how do you get growth? Here's how you get growth. It's the magic formula. This will be, don't worry, the first and last piece of mathematics I throw up here. Um, but it basically says that if economies grow, they do it in either two ways. Either they get more people working longer hours and with more capital. That certainly can work, at least for a while. And certainly there are some economies out there where that actually really works. I put up here, it's a little, little bright, so it's a little hard to see. 
but it's a picture of, from, I grabbed from the Greek Musicians Union website. And what's really striking, if it was a little darker here, you'd see that nobody in the mus in the, among the musicians has gray hair at all. The reason is apparently they get to retire at age 46 on the grounds that playing an oboe or a clarinet is hazardous work, and as a result, they're entitled to an early, early retirement and pension as part of their efforts. So there you might say, here we've got a context where perhaps working a little harder might work. But for most places, it's not about that. You know, most places, you know, we retire at 65, 67, 68. We can take it so far, but at a certain point, we've got to, instead of working more, we've got to work smarter. And that's really where the growth, the growth side of things comes in. And in fact, we sort of, when we look even during the 20th century, not during the 21st century, but even in the 20th century at the US and Europe, we see that most of the growth, around 80 or 90 percent of the growth, has come not from working harder, but from working smarter. Somehow converting, I, you know, taking the same kinds of things, the same people and the same inputs, and somehow making more stuff out of them. Now you might say, okay, well that's interesting, it's curious, but what does this have to do with small business and what we're out about small business? And the answer is that a huge chunk of that growth, whether we, as we look around the world, has come from small business. And I think one of the important reasons why we're here today celebrating this is not because small business people are wonderful people, and we know they are, not because small businesses represent a big chunk of employment, and we know they do, but because when we look to the future, small businesses are gonna be playing an enormously important role in terms of moving the economy here and the economy around the globe into the next level. And so what I'd like to do is for spend a few minutes talking about exactly why we should be celebrating small businesses, why they have such an important role. Because I think that you know, this, is, is, this is really at the heart of why Queensland and why governments around the world are looking to and celebrating small businesses and all their contributions. I think that you know, we can look at a whole number of things. We can look at jobs and we see that not only do small businesses represent a lot of jobs, but also small businesses create a lot of jobs. If you look at the United States, which is probably the extreme example, essentially almost all the job creation that we have is from small business. It's not, as, it's not essentially that General Motors or IBM don't hire people, but it's essentially for the bigger companies, for every job being created, they're also destroying a job. Where the jobs have been created, real engine of growth, has been from the smaller businesses. Secondly, when we look at innovation, new ideas, you know, big companies are always like, we've, we've got all these guys in the research labs and the white coats doing stuff. But when you look at the fundamental innovations which are there, whether it's new technologies, whether it's new services and so forth, it's largely driven by small businesses. Small businesses really punch above their weight. In other words, for the relatively modest slice of the economy they represent, they have far more new ideas being generated from them than, their, than you would suggest given the number of jobs, the money they spend on research, uh, the, the, number, the amount of economic activity they represent. Finally, they also seem to be you know, very important in terms of, uh, in terms of, of you know, sort of creating the kind, it's not just simply new ideas, but new ideas that are economically valuable. You know, essentially, we know lots, we can tell lots of stories of big companies who had enormous research labs, who came up with brilliant ideas, who sort of saw the future. And yet, when it comes to that next step of translating the idea from just a light bulb going off into something that can be actually in the marketplace, we see that small businesses, again, are a lot better at it. And I think a lot of that comes down not to, um, you know, not to the fact that they're necessarily 
smarter than anyone else, though we like to think so, and we'll say so for the sake here, but that they're just, they have to, right? You know, in the big corporation, you can, you know, sort of, you know, there's lots of people, lots of ideas floating around. Some things work, some things don't. You know, if one out of 10 ideas gets commercialized, it's fine. Small businesses don't really have that luxury to be able to let things lie on the shelf and say, hmm, maybe this is an interesting idea, but it somehow doesn't fit in with our global strategic plan, so we'll leave it you know, to, gather, to gather dust on the, on, the, on the shelf. Small businesses have that kind of urgency and intensity where they really need to go out and move this stuff into the markets, take new ideas that they have, and really translate. So it's not surprising that today, when we look really around the globe, we see governments celebrating, whether states or, or, or federal governments, celebrating small businesses and also saying, we need more of this stuff. We like this, we celebrate them, but give us more. And how do we figure out ways to make our small businesses more effective, even more effective, and even more impactful than they are than they are today. And I think that you know, in many cases, people look towards you know a few success stories that are out there: the Silicon Valleys, the you know area around Tel Aviv and Israel, you know some parts of China, Singapore, and so forth, and say these guys seem to have done something really right, where they just seem to have this ferment of small businesses getting established, young people wanting to begin these things, and then once they get started, actually doing really well and creating lots of jobs, and how do we sort of move our game up a notch, move it one more, you know, make our, our small businesses even stronger and more vital, and can we follow the examples that are, that are, that are here? And I think we can find, you know, I think, you know, in many cases people look and say, you know, there's, to, you know, it's great that there's venture capitalists running around in the United States and China funding new businesses. What about us? Why don't we have a bigger share of this kind of, uh, this kind of activity? And what can we do to sort of nurture the resources that can be taken to help our small businesses really succeed? What can we do to really bring them to the next level in terms of success? This is a question that's being asked a lot of places. And you know, it's not unreasonable that it's being asked in Australia. You know, we just put here a little chart of venture capital as a share of GDP. You know, there's Australia. It beats, it beats the UK, but, you know, it's still, you know, sort of clearly relative to the levels that we see in China, the levels that we see in the United States and Israel, it's not clearly quite, quite there yet. Clearly, this is only one slice of it and one set of issues, but it suggests why there is sort of the eagerness to go out and do some of these, uh, do, do, these, um, do, these um, do these things. Moreover, it's clear, you know, some of us come in with a little bit of skepticism, right? Saying, you know, can government do anything useful, right? I mean, that's a natural question to ask. But when we look around history, we see that there's been a whole set of things that have been done out there by governments that have made big differences in terms of helping small businesses succeed. So if we look even in the history of the United States, you know, US entrepreneurs tend to see themselves as cowboys riding the range on their horses with no help from anybody. But in point of fact, one of the sort of key things that was done was the Small Business Investment Company program in the 1950s that very much helped address some of the issues that small businesses who couldn't raise money from banks who were eager to expand but really struggled to do so. Similarly, you look at a place like Israel, which I think many people find you know, striking, is that they set up their program to help small businesses. It wasn't a huge program. They basically spent a grand total of $80 million to set, up a, uh, to set up an effort to try to bring both skills and capital to small businesses. You know, the US government, $80 million is usually the budget for erasers or something like that for one agency in one month. It's just rounding air, right? Yet that $80 million moved Israel from basically being a place which had, was basically in the you know, sort of very bottom of the list in terms of entrepreneurial activity 
into making Tel Aviv, by most measures, the third largest hub of entrepreneurial activity worldwide, of small business activity worldwide. Furthermore, the government got their $80 million back with interest, so it really ended up not costing them, uh, not costing them anything. So in a lot of ways, you can say it's, it's not surprising that governments are hungry and eager to uh, go out and help small businesses and are trying to reach out and figure out how to do this, uh, do this process. That's the good news. The bad news, of course, is that not everything that's been done to do this thing has always been a success. And that you know, while in most cases, governments have set out with a lot of positive spirit in terms of doing it, in some cases, things have gone, uh, gone awry. This is, illustrates the proposition, this was just from one of my travels la last summer, which brought me to a beautiful island in the middle of the Baltic Sea, somewhere between, uh, which is part of Sweden, but sort of almost closer to Estonia and the like. And basically they brought together, this is sort of the Swedish Davos, they brought together all of the policymakers of Sweden together and we spent the week talking about big issues affecting Sweden, lots of entrepreneurs were there and so forth talking about their concerns. And um, you know, one of the guys wanted to make a point so he brought, he was sort of an eccentric fellow and he brought over this car. Looks like just a little yellow car. It was actually built by the at a certain point, the Swedish post office felt they ought to do their bit to help entrepreneurship, so they funded somebody to go into the car making business. They said, well, we deliver a lot of letters, so we know a lot about cars, so we can get this car and our postman will go out and do this thing. The fellow who brought it over said, you know, well, of course, then they were like, where are we gonna put it? Well, let's put it in Lapland because they really need the jobs up there. You know, there's just some reindeer farming and stuff like that. Wouldn't it be nice to have an auto plant there? And then it just sort of went downhill from there. The fellow who brought it over was sort of one of these eccentric guys who collected weird cars from different places. And he had, he said among his collection was that kind of East German car. What was it called, the Trafant? Trabant, right, which was made out of cardboard. And he said the, the East German cardboard car ran better than the Swiss post, a Swedish post office car. So it just illustrates that, you know, this is not, you know, in a lot of cases, good intentions don't always translate into, um, you know, sort of successful policies. Now, how do you go, about, you know, so it's not, it's not easy. And even though we see a lot of eagerness, um, you know, it's, it's not always that there is sort of a magic formula in terms of making this thing, making this thing work. I think when we look across the experiences, we see that there are a few principles that really stand out in terms of both how governments can help small businesses and how small businesses can help governments help small businesses that I thought I'd spend a few minutes talking about and then we can sort of jump into questions and answers and really talk about whatever is, um, uh, whatever is, is, is people would like to talk about. One of the big problems is that there's often a sort of sense of one size fits all. That if we get a policy out to, get out to help small businesses, we're gonna be in a situation where we're set. We just need to do our small business policy and lay it out. And the problem is that there is, within the range of small business, a lot of different businesses with a lot of different problems associated with them. Often we'd sort of divide this into, at least in US circles, into main street businesses and gazelles, by which we mean um, you know, essentially traditional businesses and fast moving young businesses, or fast moving, growing, rapidly growing businesses. I didn't like that distinction because it was, that, was, that was sort of too US centric. I had to relabel it in some way, so I came up with high street and kangaroos. Um, so let me tell you what I mean about, uh, about that. Uh, so by high street, I mean traditional small businesses, shops, services like cutting hair or repairing, repairing, repairing cars, right? You know, the businesses that are really the backbone of our country, 
of the U.S. and really almost everywhere we look, right? This is essentially the, the, basic, the basic businesses. Typically, they're, if you add them up, each one may be small, but in aggregate, it's a very significant chunk of employment. When you look at the growth, though, most of them have grown and reached some sort of level and are probably not going to change that dramatically. But they have a whole set of other kinds of, uh, other kinds of needs that they need help, help potentially with. Then you have the fast-growing businesses. Now, this was sort of a, my problem. It was why I spent a happy number of hours trying to figure out what to call these as I was preparing the speech. I was like, you know, there are no hoofed animals in Australia, right, at least native, so calling them gazelles seemed inappropriate. Um, researching on the Internet, I discovered that the world's fastest animal on a size-adjusted basis is an Australian form of dust mite, which compared to the cheetah is actually twice as fast. So I was going to call it, you know, high street and dust mites. But then I was like, you know, I just don't think I want to go there. This just doesn't have a right vibe. So I went for kangaroos instead. Now I know, at least in some circles, we, I was just out in the Blue Mountains and they were like, kangaroos, we eat them. They're varmints. They're pests. But still, you know, I was like, all right, let's just sort of, um, uh, let's just sort of use them. Now, of course, we say, you know, what are these fast-growing businesses? When we think about it, you know, what first comes to mind is some, um, you know, 23-year-old with a ponytail in a garage thinking, writing some sort of crazy code for some, for some sort of social media company. And, of course, there, that's there. But there's also a whole lot of other things that are fast-growing businesses. We can think about finance and all the sort of new ideas that are coming in terms of how people get paid and uh, raise money. We can think about lots of services where people are taking traditional stuff that's high touch, but bringing in some of the information technology and other things into the, into the, into the mix. Most of these businesses are small, and not all of them are going to make it. But the ones, the kangaroos which are going to make it, are going to represent a very significant chunk of employment. Now, I think when we look at Australia, we see that, you know, there's some very good news and then some other stuff that's perhaps, you know, a little bit more, uh, more challenging. So, you know, the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, which is probably the most careful look at entrepreneurship around the world, which, um, you know, our sponsors are obviously very closely involved with, you know, tries to take a very systematic look at entrepreneurship around the globe. And they've found that you know, if you look at, you know, sort of adults who are involved in terms of starting businesses, Australia is at the very top. Well, actually, we in the U.S. are slightly bumped them out, but, you know, they're essentially in the stratosphere of the, how many countries are now involved in the survey? It's 60-something. Over 100. Thanks, Pam. Um, you know, so, you know, essentially, you know, it's, it's, it's clear that this is, you know, to say, you know, Australians don't take risks or aren't willing to take chances, that's, you know, that's, um, uh, that's perhaps misleading, right? Now, on the other hand, there's, as you sort of look at it, you see a lot of this is self-employment. A lot of it is what's called needs-based businesses, which are essentially more, you know, sort of, you know, much closer to high street than to the kangaroo land. And it seemed that in some sense, at least in their numbers, it suggested the high growth firms were somewhat underrepresented. I think we can look in a variety of ways, and as we, we had a very interesting policy discussion this morning, and you know, one of the things that's very highlighted is that looking at different data in different ways gives you different numbers. And that, you know, once you get into sort of fighting about numbers about this, you're sort of in this, you know, we, we please cancel all afternoon appointments and we'll talk for five till five o'clock about all the data issues around measuring entrepreneurship. But I think that when we look at a variety of these measures, we see that, well, you know, that when we look at the, the kangaroos or the subset of kangaroos, you know, this is essentially some numbers around technology companies, it suggests there's still, still a bit of a ways to go and there's still opportunities for further, for further expansion. So given this, given that things are good in some respects but not perfect, 
are there things the government can do to really help these companies, whether it's the high street companies or the, or the high growth companies, the kangaroos? And I think the answer is yes. I'm gonna speak briefly. This is a topic which I could happily speak on for many hours, but let me just emphasize a point which is something we've heard already in our conversation here. I think that in many places when you look, the initial temptation of government is to say, we know what to do to solve this thing. We're gonna hand out money. And you know, in America, the politicians like these big oversized checks and handing them to someone. And there's sort of very much this temptation to say, let's just go and print up a bunch of oversized checks and hand them out to, um, to, hand them out to entrepreneurs and that'll solve the problem. Unfortunately, you far too often end up like our Swedish car story, choosing the wrong people to support. And I think that certainly one of the most important lessons that you know, I think has been taken to heart here, but which I think you know, certainly is not something that a state government alone can solve, that really is something that really also involves federal policy as well, is that it's really important to think about, you know, before one gets into let's do this or do that, let's think about the environment, the playing field, and make the playing field as favorable to small businesses as we can. Now, there's a lot of things that can be done, and I think we've, you know, sort of talked about, we've already talked about some, we have talked about more of them. Taxes, we've talked about, you know, labor, people, you know, how do we get, you know, the good news about small businesses is that they hire people, the bad news is sometimes they need to lay them off. So having the freedom to be able to get the, the ebb and flow in terms of people in and out. There's also a set of things about culture or environment or willingness to take risks. And I think that you know, this is perhaps a harder thing for government to, to, to change, but it can be done. So I think you know, the, you know, I just put up here as one sort of crazy example, but a sort of neat one as well, of one thing the Singaporean government did, which is essentially create a award for, which they call the Phoenix Award, which is for the most meritorious failure for a small business. So the idea is, if you fail, fail glamorously, and you get a chance to meet the prime minister and uh, get a get a little check and a nice uh, a nice thing. But of course, you know, the idea was to say, now it's not that we want more failures per se, but we want people out there taking chances and being able to go out and um, and um, and do these um, do these things. All right. I was very enthusiastic. I love talking about this stuff and made another 80 slides around these, uh, around these issues. But I'm gonna resist the temptation to talk about them and just end with one other side in terms of this. Which is, we, we started with celebrating small business and saying small business is something which is really critical. We said it's understandable why people wanna help small businesses and we talked a little bit about government policies and what makes sense and what doesn't. The other really important thing to emphasize that certainly in our classes at Harvard I'm always sort of emphasizing is that in a way we can't really wait for somebody to help us. As small businesses, we also really need to be helping, helping ourselves. And I think there's at least a couple of things that are worth spending a moment on highlighting. One of which is really the kind of extraordinary thing that's really happening around the world today in terms of the digital revolution. Now you might say, this is just a story for large companies which have big IT budgets and the like, but it's not. And in particular, I think that in many respects, one of my colleagues you know, has popularized the phrase, the long tail, saying that today there are lots of people who want lots of things that they couldn't find before, and if you can figure out a way to reach out and get it to them, it doesn't have to be some sort of fancy technology, it just simply has to be saying, can we exploit some of the existing technologies that are out there to broaden our reach and broaden our power? I think the final thing I'll emphasize is simply the importance of communication. That I think policymakers you know, are eager to help small businesses, but ultimately I think they need the guidance in terms of the experiences and the perspectives of what people are struggling with. And sort of having that channel of communication between the small business world and the 
and the public officials is absolutely enormously, enormously important. That storytelling is extremely, extremely important. So with that, I'll bring it to an end and very much thank the hosts for the chance to do this and for your attention. Thank you. I'd like to welcome Trevor Mahoney to the um, stage to uh, thank Professor Lerner, and that will come before the Q&A. And I believe the Premier has to go now as well. Do you want to hang around for a while? Good. Fantastic. Thank you, Peter. Uh, the Honourable Premier, Campbell Newman, uh, Honourable James Tuckey, MP for Minister for Tourism, Major Events, Small Business and Commonwealth Games. Mark Brennan, Australian Small Business Commissioner. Dr Jeff Garrett, Queensland Chief Scientist. And of course, a Professor uh, Lerner uh, from Investment Banking at the Harvard Business School. Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Trevor Mahoney uh, and I lead a team at PricewaterhouseCoopers dedicated uh, to serving uh, small businesses but probably more importantly, growing businesses as well. Uh, it's my honour today uh, to give the vote of thanks. Um, we um, are very pleased uh, to be involved in, in Queensland Small Business Week uh, as the goal sponsor. Uh, as I said, uh, we're committed to, to helping small businesses, individuals grow their business and achieve their personal ambitions. Sponsoring today's event is just one way uh, that we're pleased to be partnering with the government uh, to sp support the small business community. Uh, we've also been working with the Queensland government this year on a number of different projects aimed at helping them to develop you know, innovative strategies to improve how services are delivered to Queensland businesses. Uh, one such project, uh, which has been really exciting for us, is hosting a series of open innovation events uh, where we will bring together a community of entrepreneurs businesses, researchers and others uh, and connect them with the key government stakeholders to help tackle problems worth solving. Uh, among other things, uh, the Small Business Week provides you the opportunity to learn, uh, extremely important, and be inspired by others and particularly uh, from people like our keynote speaker today, uh, Professor Lerner. Uh, Professor Lerner, on behalf of uh, the, all of the delegates here today, thank you for sharing your insights, uh, very informative. Um, I was particularly pro uh, pleased, I think, to say, well, this is a celebration of small business and your emphasis on the important part that small business plays uh, in the overall economy. Um, growth was something that touched on, on earlier and, and the importance of growth and, and how we should work smarter uh, and not harder. Uh, I keep telling my staff at the office that. Uh, I'm not quite sure they believe me, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's extremely, um, extremely relevant. Um, interesting to, to hear the statistics around the disproportionate uh, contribution to, to innovation, which um, sometimes goes unseen and I think uh, is people's perception that it does get left to the big end of town. Um, it isn't easy uh, and particularly in, a, in, um, in, in days like today where we've got you know, mega trends coming, coming down the line at a, uh, at, a, at a rapid rate, the digital uh, uh, innovations that you referred to, um, the, the, politic uh, the, the power shift uh, through to Asia and how small business need to uh, get involved there. Uh, these are things that need to be dealt with and it's something that small business and growing business should not try to to do on their own. It's extremely important that, uh, that you do um, find a, a trusted business advisor uh, and set a strategy. Uh, strategy, 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 I think is something uh, that is key to success and it doesn't have to be complicated. It can be uh, simple, but uh, you must be true to yourself. Um, the solutions won't come easily. Um, this week is uh, something that's a fantastic uh, step on behalf of the Queensland Government. Um, I doubt there will be any big checks being written, uh, given uh, you know, the, the, the state that we, we find the, uh, the economy in uh, after, after all the years that have gone behind us. But um, 
I think the government uh, is playing a, an important role um, and uh, I like the reference around that you made uh, failing glamorously. Uh, I think um, another lesson uh, to the audience would be if you're going to fail, fail fast as well so that you uh, can, can uh, get on and, and, and do something else. But again, on behalf of the delegates here, uh, Professor Lerner, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Now it's time for Q&A. Um, so if you have any questions for um, Professor Lerner, I've got a couple of questions just to kick off to what, while people are thinking about the question. I think I'll right, make one comment to you. You know, we know in small business it's great to have a name that you can actually build off, a brand building name. And when you're in your game and your name is Lerner, that is a really <laughs> clever piece of brand building, I've got, I got to say. I guess I have to thank my grandfather for that one. Right? Yeah, without a doubt, without a doubt. Um, do you have, because you talked about the important role of government being there to help small businesses, what is your best story of a business that really has become even internationally well known where government actually had an important role in those early stages? Easy question, I know you've got right. probably 5,000 well, cases. Well, I think there's any number of them, but certainly one, one which would sort of jump out would be Intel. Intel is inside a lot of things, including probably most of the devices we're carrying around with us. And yet, when they started, they were confused, right? They, eventually, they figured out the way to make money was with logic chips. But they started off just doing boring old memory chips. It was just very much of a commodity kind of business. And they went down this road. They were definitely a small business by US standards, in other words, under, other, under they were above 20, but they were certainly under 500, and they just hit the wall. They basically were competing with um, Japanese, later Chinese companies, and you know, essentially the pr it was just a brutal price kind of story. And ultimately, they figured out they needed to retool themselves and to really rethink what it was they were doing. And as part of that, you know, they went back to their investors and said, well, we know we burnt through a lot of your money. We tried this, it didn't work. We tried that, it didn't work, and so forth. But now we really got it. And many of the private sector investors looked at this thing and said, look, what do they say, fool me once, you know, fool me twice kind of thing. They were just not really willing to write the check that was needed. And you know, the, the, in particular there, the Small Business Investment Company program really allowed them to be able to um, retool themselves. It wasn't really a case of the government saying, do this, rather change your mind, mm. but really being able to enable it to go and do a bunch of things that it couldn't do otherwise. Yeah. And obviously today, you know, when we think about that in terms of jobs, in terms of exports, and a lot of other things, you know, it's, it's certainly no longer a small business, but it really allowed them to make the kind of transition they needed to needed to make. Mm, without a doubt. Now, are there questions here from the audience? One down the front there. Hi, I'm, I'm Rachel Parker, Dean of Research Development at QUT. And I actually want to ask a question about large firms uh, in this sense. The US and, in fact, Sweden have a very large number of multinationals per mm -hmm. capita. They have lead firms in global value chains. Countries like Australia, we're a small economy, fairly remote from geographically, uh, and small firms face a particular challenge, I think, in connecting to global value chains. And we have very few domestic multinationals in engineering and technology intensive industries. So what can governments do, I guess, about connecting our small firms better with global value chains, given that context? Well, I think you raise a great question, which is to say that for small businesses, I think we need to really emphasize that part of it is not just simply about going out and being successful yourself, but also working with others, right? And you sort of can, we can look at you know, many, many success stories in terms of entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial businesses where, or, or small businesses where a lot of the key transition they made was in terms of partnerships and other things that allowed them to leverage that sort of core insight they had 
and to play on a much larger, on a much larger scale. And I think that you're right, saying that you know, certainly if you think about you know, something like uh, Silicon Valley, you say one of the reasons why it's so easy, or it's not easy, but why it's relatively easier for small businesses to succeed is you've got around you all these giants who are used to playing with smaller firms. You know, whether they a uh, Google or, uh, uh, or uh, Facebook or whatever, you know, you've got all these potential partners to, who are used to reaching out and grabbing on to, to the really good ideas and figuring out ways to work together. It's clearly harder in Australia probably for two reasons, one of which is the, um, uh, one of which is the fact that you just have a s sort of smaller, uh, smaller pool of large corporations to play with, as it were. And the second thing is, of course, that it just may be that this kind of deal making, this kind of alliance thing, is just simply something that's less familiar to, uh, to um, uh, large corporations. I think if there's a fix, it really lies in broadening your scope as to who the sort of potential partners, uh, who the potential partners may be. There was recently a relatively fascinating study which compared um, entrepreneurial businesses in Finland versus those in Germany. And it made the point that the entrepreneurial businesses in Finland were much better at finding collaborations, even though the number of collaborative partners that you might have in Finland would seem to be a relatively smaller number. And the reason seemed to be that the German companies were like, Germany's big, let's just figure out a way to go to knock on the doors of the other German companies and form a partnership with one of them. The Finns, on the other hand, were like, we don't have the luxury of limiting ourselves to doing some collaboration with a Finnish company. We've really got to set our sights on the world and say, who are potential partners in the US, in China, in Europe, and reach out much more broadly. And I think there's probably a little bit of the, you can draw a little bit of the same kind of lesson for here, saying that in a way, you know, admittedly it is a challenge not having that many global corporations and the like, but it really, I think, pushes more to say you need to broaden your, broaden horizons around potential collaborations and really look perhaps outside the borders of the nation as to where might be, where might be partnerships. Right. Any other questions? Over there. Hi, uh, Lee Angus from NICTA National ICT Australia as well as uh, the Startup Working Group for uh, Queensland's Decidia. Um, just a question there in regards to what appeared to be a multiplier effect for VC investment uh, as opposed to R&D. I was wondering if you might be able to talk to perhaps the, if there is a multiplier effect for angel investing and if so, is there also a role for government to help support angel investors for promoting uh, innovation in the community? Yeah, this is a fascinating area, and we've actually, and, and as, as many of you know, there's been really worldwide an explosion in terms of angel, angel activity, both in terms of individuals just simply writing checks, but more generally in terms of angel, angel groups and, collabor and, and collaborations. And you know, some of it has been like through angel list enabled through information technology, others of it is just the old style of people sitting down every other Monday and over lunch and hearing some presentations from you know, interesting, interesting entrepreneurs. We've been trying to understand some of the impact of angel investing because it seems to be such a, an important, uh, important phenomenon. And we've done some looking in the United States and what we found is you know, quite striking. We haven't done this with every angel group. As you can imagine, if it's hard getting data about small businesses and their measurement issues, when it comes to prying information about from rich guys about what investments they made and how successful they've been, it's a little hard, particularly when it comes to getting them to tell about the stuff they did that didn't end up making money. It's particularly challenging to get information out from them. But what we find is that just as it seems that venture has this sort of powerful, powerful multiple effect, and as I sort of very briefly alluded to, they are essentially every dollar of venture capital seems to, trans to be as effective in boosting new ideas as three dollars of traditional big corporate R&D. You see much of the same dynamic in terms of angel investing. 
that essentially a company which, you know, and these are typically very small businesses, often with just one or two employees or even no employees, just a, just a PowerPoint presentation, that gets the interest from an angel group ends up being far more successful in terms of um, employment, five years later, sales, even basically being able to attract additional financing. That angels seem to be something that's very special and very powerful. Now, we've originally just did this in the United States. We've now enlisted around a dozen and a half angel groups around the world to share with us their experiences. Um, it's taken a bit of a, uh, a little bit of a United Nations of research assistance to do this in the sense we've gotten stacks of documents in Chinese arriving in our office and so forth that we need to uh, piece through. But at least on a preliminary basis, it seems that we're seeing much the same story there, that angels as well, it's not just simply a US story, that it's really a global story, are very powerful in boosting small businesses. <laughs> the challenge, of course, is how do you get more of them? If we like this stuff, how do you get it? Um, and again, you know, there seems to be at least a few things that can be done to catalyze this process, to encourage groups to meet. You know, in many cases, people are trying tax credits and other things to say, if you do one of these angel investments and you get some big return from this, we really like this stuff and we're willing to give you a lower, a lower you, you don't have to pay as much taxes from it. But in a lot of ways, it seems that this is a sort of one of these things that has to grow of its own, that the government can jump start it, but ultimately what we need to have is successful entrepreneurs who make money, who are willing to play the game in terms of investing in other entrepreneurs and the like. Mm. But in interesting, you make the point. I, I, I presume you're saying that the businesses that hook up with angels tend to do well. Is that what right. you're saying? Right. But in, in a sense, to get an angel to like right. you, right. you have to really lift your game. I know right. in my case, that when I look for, for right. funding, if we looked like crap, right. they wouldn't have supported right. us. Exactly. So this is, you know, without... To, to getting, put it roughly. Know, so essentially the game what we play is we look at the company, you know, many of these angel groups, you know, they meet over, um, uh, over uh, breakfast or, or over drinks and here are the pitches and they'll typically fill out score sheets and say, this guy we really like, yeah. this one is sort of okay, she don't like so much, you know, they sort of go through It's like it. Dragon's Den or Shark Tank. Yeah, exactly, isn't it? it's exactly. all, the, all the, sa the same kind of fun. Yeah. And what we do is we compare the guys who, you know, not the, you know, the person who got the highest rating and the lower rating, because we know that those are very, very big differences. But the people who just squeaked, squeaked by in terms of getting funding were the ones who came ever so close, but fell a little bit short of it. Yeah. So there we say, you know, you know, the difference in terms of quality is not that large in terms of the businesses themselves, right? Mm -hmm. These are all small business people who went out and did a credible case, not a bang up case, not a terrible case, but you know, somewhere in the middle of the pack, and you know, what happened to those guys who just squeaked above were the ones who were just left behind, and how did they evolve in the years in the years to come? Yeah. So that's how we try to get away from that mm. that problem of saying if you compare the top guy to the bottom guy, you've got enormous amounts of differences, but we can't really give the angels credit for having caused those changes. No. Any other questions? Over here, and over there, back and side. Uh, per Davidson, uh, Australian Centre for Entrepreneurship Research at QUT. Um, the accent in Swed is Swedish, so I, I have to start with um, correcting you on that hideous postal <laughs> services <laughs> car. Very uh, sensitive Swede. It, it was produced in the late 1960s. Right. So, it anyway, was a while ago. There, there is a fabulous story about a plastic bicycle from the 80s that I could give right. to you that, <laughs> that makes exactly the point. Anyway. Um, this is Small Business Week, and, and um, of course, so therefore your, your, your speech is un, under the heading of small business, but I think you've alluded to the point that I'm, I'm going to make. Uh, we know that small businesses are important. Uh, if we remove them, there would be a big chunk of, 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 of the jobs, and, and a lot of things in society wouldn't work. But we also know that it is not the stock of current small business that uh, are great job creators right. or uh, great innovators. Uh, so um, I think we should we should talk more about new business, perhaps, mm. uh, and 
and dynamic small business, uh, those that offer buyers uh, new alternatives, give incumbents a kick in the butt to improve their game, and also inspire followers to, to follow suit and do more of the same uh, if they're successful. Uh, because, I mean, the, the last thing we really want to do is to support current small businesses, make life easier for them in their current form, rather we would, would try to inspire them to, to continue and, and to develop. So, would you agree we should talk more, a little bit more about new and a little bit less about small? Well, I guess what I would say is that it's really um, yes and yes. That in some sense, absolutely, kangaroos are important and we should be doing all we can to sort of supercharge them to grow as much as possible. But I think the, I guess where I disagree a little more is saying that, you know, what I call the high street businesses, the businesses which may have less potential for future growth are unimportant and something we ought to neglect. And I think again there, we, when we look not only at the size of, size of employment that they represent, but also the opportunities that are there. I mean, I'm just continuously struck by, you know, how much opportunity there is for bringing in, you know, compliment, you know, in many cases you've got great, great business people, people with enormous intuition for their markets and so forth. But with the addition of some compliments, whether it's capital or an exposure to some of the most exciting new ideas of how to segment the market or whatever, can really you know, do much more to fulfill their potential. So I agree absolutely that we should focus on, ca on kangaroos, but I guess I would also say that we should very much be focused on high street as well. Yeah, I'll give you an example that probably makes me support um, Josh's uh, point of view. Um, when Nabi Saleh brought uh, Gloria Jeans from America to Australia, he had two outlets. Um, he now has a thousand outlets. He's in 37 countries. He's brought the franchise back off the Americans. And this was, a, this was a high street business. And he basically, because he was successful, he found he could grow. And I think a lot of family businesses that start right. in the high street, then all of a sudden have a maverick son who comes on the scene or, right. a, or a, a, an outside the square thinking daughter that takes the business to the next right. level. And they actually do become new businesses as well as established businesses. Right. And I think I mean, we see this all the time with the um, owner's president's program at Harvard, which you alluded to in the introduction, mm. which is to say, we usually don't get dad, right? Dad's like, who's founded the company, is like, I've got my own way of doing things. Yeah, my son's going to you. No, right, no, no, no. exactly. It's really the sons or daughters who yeah. show up at the program, and they're the ones who are like, we need to get this kind of frameworks and the approaches to sort of bring this thing to the next level. And it's just amazing how many times you see what seems like something, you, you, I teach the finance, so people bring in the spreadsheets for me, and it's like, you know, pretty much fla they plateau, right? Mm. They've reached their limits. And then with the sort of input in terms of new ideas and new perspectives, perhaps partially just added confidence, right? That people see their peer group and see them succeeding and suddenly they're like, I can do this thing too. Mm. How much of a, tra how, much, how much what seem like sleepy older businesses can transform themselves? Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, uh, back there? Okay, um, Jeremy Alexander studying podiatry at QUT, but uh, hopefully that won't last too much longer. Um, <laughs> just uh, wondering, um, not much has been uh, mentioned about uh, not-for-profit organisations. Right. Um, just wondering if you could clarify the benefits um, and the support that um, uh, is provided to not-for-profit organisations versus um, things like angel investors. Right. Um, and more specifically, is there a preferred avenue for small big businesses that think big? Well, I think you, first of all, you can see that I did a miserable failure at getting through my <laughs> yeah. 87 slides that I had allocated for, you know, 26 minutes. So at least the one piece of good news is I resisted the temptation to add half a dozen slides about social entrepreneurship as well. Because it's an absolutely fascinating topic, but once we got into it, we could go on and on without, uh, with, with a great deal, because there's so much interesting stuff there. But I think really one of the really extraordinary things we're seeing today is uh, the, I guess you could describe it as sort of the infection of a lot of the ideas that are associated with 
small businesses and funding small businesses into the realm of the nonprofit realm as well. That you know, many people who are either individuals who are givers or foundations are saying, can we take some of the same discipline we would do if we were funding uh, an entrepreneur doing a business and apply it to our charitable giving as well? What do I mean by that? In part, it means saying, you know, let's set up goals, saying, you know, we're going to fund you not, you know, next year, not automatically and just renew new grant, but you have to, your goals are to do A, B, and C, and if you don't reach these things, we'll think about not funding you. It's about, you know, sort of saying, rather than having a board with 40 people that get together for a cocktail party, let's make a lean board which is really engaged and involved essentially taking the best ideas in terms of, of working with entrepreneurial businesses, that kind of intensity, the urgency, the excitement that's associated with this, and moving it into the realm of, uh, moving it into the realm of nonprofits. And I think this really is, an, in many senses, again, you, know, so you could almost call that another illustration of the power of small business, that this model seems to work so well that it's really reaching out to realms like essentially nonprofits, which would seem to be completely different from the land of commerce. So I think it's a, a great question and one that uh, we could certainly talk about at uh, considerable length. And um, okay, yeah. maybe, ne maybe next year. Maybe next, next year. year. Exactly. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of time. So please, would you put your hands together for Josh, please? And I now would like to call the Minister Stuckey back to the stage to uh, launch a wonderful book called Shining Bright. The Minister. I was actually enjoying myself, and uh, I think you'd have to agree that the, the topic today, and, um, and thank you to your wonderful facilitation too, has, has certainly uh, got us all thinking a little more broadly, a little more widely, and uh, um, I, I discovered that I used to be a tiger, a small business tiger, that is, about 30 years ago when I ran my own small business, but we didn't have those things then, so it's really exciting to see. Um, ladies and gentlemen, as you heard a little earlier from the Premier, the Queensland Government does recognise and respect the critical role that our small businesses play. There's a heck of a lot for all of our small businesses to feel very proud of. Running a small business is hard work for many, though it is about making a dream a reality, building something from scratch and also from the heart. This afternoon, I have the enormous pleasure of launching a unique publication called Shining Bright, a celebration of Queensland small business. This e-book publication is a tribute from the Queensland Government to this entrepreneurial fighting spirit, showcasing some of our uniquely Queensland businesses. It tells their stories and experiences in setting up, running and growing their enterprises. I hope they provide motivation to existing businesses to continue their good work and inspire a new generation of small business entrepreneurs. I'd like to acknowledge that some of the businesses profiled in the book here in the audience today. Thank you so much for being a part of this important project. On leaving today's lunch, you'll receive a printed copy of the book and I encourage you all to read the stories and marvel as I have in what our small businesses are achieving. The book will also be available online through the small business page on the business industry portal and I won't rattle that off again. So please make sure that you do share it with your business colleagues, your friends and of course family so that you can all go online and take a look. If you look on your table you'll notice a very special bookmark for you to take away. Think of it as a way of bookmarking your place in the 2014 Queensland Small Business Week. After all, Queensland small businesses are run and operated by our families, our neighbours and our friends. Hard working folk who are the backbone of Queensland's four pillar economy. 
Queensland's Small Business Week is our opportunity to officially acknowledge their efforts and to say a very big thank you. I'd now like to present to our speakers the first copies of Shining Bright in appreciation for their support of this week. And Josh, we expect to see a, a photo beamed back to us of this beautiful copy of Queensland businesses on a coffee table in Harvard. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we do have copies for. Yep. Yep. Yes. Peter. I hope you've made some for me, Hansel and Ugly. Oh, yeah, you're giving me a kiss as well. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Brennan, if you're able to pop, come up here, it's lovely to see you again. Thank you so much for making the effort to come to Queensland. You should do it more often. <laughs> I've never kissed a minister. Never kissed a minister. <laughs> and we can't forget PwC, can we, Trevor Mahoney? Thank you. So that brings us to the end of the, the day today. On your table today is a selfie competition. We encourage you to take a selfie and upload it to hashtag QLD small biz to enter the competition. Remember there are plenty more events you can attend during the week. I believe the Minister will be travelling to the Sunshine Coast and Roma for further events this week. And thank you for joining us today. And remember Queensland where small business shines. See you in 2015. Thanks very much. <laughs>